Hi, I'm Scott Hill. I'm one of the curators at Sydney Living Museums. You've already been looking at the kitchen and the kitchen garden here at Vaucluse House. Now we're going to have a look at the other end of food preparation and what happens in the dining room and the art of dining. Throughout the 19th century, the way people ate changed significantly from the a la Francaise style, which we're about to talk about, through to the a la Russe style. Here at Vaucluse House, though, it's very much in the Francaise style. That literally means in the French manner. And we can set out the table according to that. So to start with, we're going to have, let's say we're setting the table for four people. So a family dinner. Already you start to see that the very basic idea of the Francaise style, which is that it's a geometrically organized style. So all of the dishes, all of the plates that are going on are going to have this really strong geometric relationship to each other. And you'll certainly see that as we get to, you know, to the bigger serving dishes. So looking at an actual place setting, we have the cutlery. And the basic idea is you start from the outside and work in. So on the outside here, we've got some cutlery set up for uh, the entree courses. We've also then got a linen napkin. This is quite fun. If you think napkins sometimes are quite big, this is actually a small linen napkin. It's produced to the measurements given in the Workwoman's Guide, which is a 19th century guide to household linen and napery, which we use as a reference quite a lot in our houses. So here we have a napkin. Then onto that goes this. Now, the soup spoon that most of you are probably familiar with, with that round dish head on the top, that doesn't arrive until quite late in the 19th century, uh, the 1880s, the 1890s. Instead, we have this. Now, this is a tablespoon. So when you're cooking, and the recipe may say, add a heaped tablespoon of sugar, this is what it's actually referring to. They're really quite large spoons. And most people, if you were to spot them in, say, um, a second-hand store, you might think this was actually a serving spoon. But it's a tablespoon. And it's used for general table use, but especially for soup. So here we have that ready to go in the center just there. And glasses for the various wines that are being served with the dinner. Then we come to the actual layout of the dishes of the food that's arriving at the table. At one end, we have a soup tureen ready to go perhaps um, a brown soup, or if it was a, uh, if you're really trying to impress your guests, a white soup, which has an almond base. That's the kind of soup that you hear about, uh, say, in a Regency novel, when I have white soup prepared enough. That's the kind of impressive soup that they're cooking. And a ladle ready to go. At the other end, you may have fish ready to go onto that. Then the other dishes, say in this case, we've got two vegetable dishes, are arranged symmetrically. So there's that idea again, you've got a very strong line of axis here, another strong line of axis going across here. And these dishes are arranged to answer each other. Now, what that means is that, say you have uh, the fish and the soup here, they answer each other. If these were two vegetable dishes, they're arranged to answer each other. Say you've got uh, chicken and beef at different ends of the table, or mutton, for instance, they answer each other. If we were doing a bigger table setting with extra um, covers like this, say we had four of them here, for instance, you would have perhaps a vegetable here and a vegetable here, and they answer each other in that direction. Uh, perhaps two other meat dishes might answer each other in that direction. But there's always that kind of a relationship. What that means is that no person at any one end is surrounded by just the veg vegetable dishes or just the meat dishes, for instance. 
So when we're looking at the first course, we're starting with soup and perhaps with fish. Around here, it could be an imported salted fish, but also all of the fish that are being caught around Sydney Harbour. At this end, say this is Mrs Wentworth's end of the table. She also has the soup plates. And they're placed in front of her. She is then serving from the terrine and they're being passed around the table or perhaps in a wealthy house being taken around perhaps by a footman. And just a couple of extra serving spoons there. This pattern, by the way, these are all props that we use uh, in programs out at Elizabeth Farm. Uh, they're all modern, but the pattern is one that's been made since 1811, so it's quite appropriate uh, for inside these historic houses. So imagine that the soup has been passed around and we've now finished with that. The fish is then eaten, and then we get what's called a remove. So that's gone, it's taken away, and in might come, say, a haunch of roast mutton or one of the beginning of the heavier meat dishes. And that goes up at this end, and in this case, uh, William Charles Wentworth is seated at this end. And um, one of his roles at the table is the carving of the meat. So what is actually happening here is that we get what's called social dining. Uh, if it's a small table like this, yes, you might be able to reach everything yourself, but at a bigger table, it's your neighbours around you who are serving you. So that's that idea of social dining. It's a very interactive table setting. Then we get to the second course, and all of these might be taken away. I'm just going to pretend I'm taking them all away. And let's say, for instance, we have a different arrangement. But again, it's, this is a very linear arrangement. But again, it's that idea about answering. So you might have two meat dishes here, perhaps, uh, mutton or roast beef at this end, perhaps uh, roast fowl, so uh, duck or poultry down on this end. And again, two vegetable dishes here. But again, you might also then arrange them on the diagonal, but again, that idea of answering. So that relationship between the dishes as they're all arranged geometrically. Then we get to the final course, so for the dessert, and that's where something dramatically different starts to happen because all of this goes. So quite literally, the table is cleared. I'm not going to clear the entire table just for, just for this. And items of dessertware are then being brought in. And they're placed onto the bare wood, highly polished wood of the table. And that's why mahogany is one of those very favoured timbers. Uh, for a dining table because it could be very highly polished and very impressive when the cloth is removed. That's actually the expression that you see, uh, the cloth is removed, that pops up in uh, journals, in diaries and in novels to explain what has happened at this point. So we have knitted doilies, for instance, that might be placed out. Also under the various place settings. And dessertware is often quite fanciful. So here we've actually got some replicas of uh, MacArthur dessertware, which, which was commissioned uh, in Canton, uh, so Guangzhou in southern China, uh, and brought out um, by Hannibal Hawkins MacArthur for his aunt and his uncle, John and Elizabeth. And they're quite fanciful shapes. Here you've got the Ruyi shape, so a very traditional Chinese pattern. It might be being used as perhaps an individual place setting. Then you have other wonderful ones like this. This is a berry basket with this sort of really lovely pierced sides. And on the inside, with the decoration 
of all these wonderful grapes and grapevines, you can also see the monogram E and J MacArthur. So that's the dessert course. And when you're laying it out, it goes out in very much the same way. Still a geometrically ordered way, but you might also have uh, glass dishes and a pern with fruit, things like that in the middle, um, cakes, cheeses. But it's arranged still in this basic geometric pattern. When you visit Vaucluse's house today, you actually see an ar a dessert arrangement that's created using Wentworth pieces. Something different, though, starts to happen towards, really towards the end of the century on Australian fashionable tables, at any rate. Um, in the early 1800s, probably around somewhere around 1811 to 1814, in Paris, a new style of dining was being observed, and this was called a la russe, sort of in the Russian manner. It was very different to this a la Francaise style because you had none of this. Instead, you had the individual place settings and a plate that had been pre-prepared with various foodstuffs on it was brought to you and placed individually in front of each diner. It was a very different style of dining. It seems to have appeared at the residence of the Russian ambassador to France in this period. It began to be noticed very quickly in very wealthy and fashionable houses, both in France and in London. It is a style that goes through various phases and the, the definitions of a la russe that are given, say, over the first 50 years vary considerably. Uh, one definition given in a servant's guide describes Roos actually as a series of dishes placed across the table, which means it's a very wide table. And there's, say, as the first course is finished, the second course is brought forward. So you would have like a whole row of plates across the table. The other thing that the Roos style means is that you've now got, instead of an, arra a, an arrangement of different uh, covers, vegetable dishes, terrines, you've now got a great empty swathe of table in the centre. So this is when table decoration really starts to come into its own. You might have uh, a mirrored plateau uh, across the centre of the table then with sculptures, flower vases, um, elaborate aperns, candlesticks running down the middle of the table to fill that void. In Britain, a variation of the Russe style appeared known as uh, a la anglais to the French uh, in the English manner. Uh, that's the style that you'll be very familiar with from seeing a period drama where you may have the diner sitting here and a footman comes in and offers the plate. The diner then serves themselves and the footman then goes on. One other very different aspect of dining in the 19th century uh, in Australia is at what time of the day you ate. And if we look at, say, uh, letters and journals of families like the Wentworths and the MacArthurs, you see that the first meal of the day, so the breakfast, might actually be taken around 10, 10.30, maybe even as late as 11 o'clock. That doesn't mean you've just got up, but it means you may have been up, say, since 6, 6.30, You've worked and then you take the break for your morning breakfast. There isn't luncheon, not yet. Then the main meal, so the dinner, may actually take place at, say, three o'clock in the afternoon. We've got a good reference from Elizabeth MacArthur talking about their household in the 1820s dining after three. As the 19th century goes on, uh, the dinner hour starts to go further towards the evening and the breakfast hour goes more towards sunrise. And so you start to get a bigger gap in the middle of the day and people are obviously getting hungry. And that's where luncheon comes from. Uh, it's that meal at the centre of the day really to fill the very large gap. The typical pattern is it's in wealthier houses that can afford uh, better lighting, 
that their meals are pushed forward uh, into the early evening, even into the evening hours themselves, when, of course, you do need lighting. Another way of explaining the difference between a la Francaise and a la Russe is by giving the example of, say, a roast dinner. If it was a Francaise style, it might be like this. At one end, you have roast beef, roast chicken being laid out. Peas. Roast potatoes, carrots, for instance. So, all the different dishes here contain an element of the meal. That's also important because it helps you to understand the often bewildering array of dishes that you find in 19th century menus. A table setting like this might have eight different dishes described, but if you think about it, it's all the things you might find on one plate. Uh, meat, peas, potatoes, carrots, for instance. But each one of those is considered a dish in its own right. If you then think of the a la russe, instead of having all of these here, the plate comes to you and you might have roast chicken or beef, peas, carrots, potatoes and gravy as well, already on that plate. That's a really simple way of thinking about the difference between the two styles. So the next time you come to Vaucluse House, have a look at the dining table and look at the way it's been set, the way it's been arranged. And maybe you can take some of the elements of the Francaise style home for your own table.